back you up, okay, brother. The same week that they were literally saying for everyone in England to open their doors and we will pay you 350 pounds for every Ukrainian oh, oh, yeah. that, you, that you take in. But yet when it came to the dark skin, global majority that have been dying trying to get to England, okay, um, in, in, in their rafts and what have you, okay, all of a sudden they are seen as illegal immigrants to such an extent that they could be flown away four to 6,000 miles away to Rwanda, the same country that Britain only a year ago was cussing about their human rights situation, okay? If that is not a wake-up call, if that is not a wake-up call to us as a people, how we are seen, yeah, how we are seen. In fact, European people talk about it. This ain't just about us. They talk about it and they joke about it. Just watch. That's why we're offering cash incentives to host Ukrainian refugees. Question, so while that's great, why didn't you do that for Syrian refugees? Well, um, Syria is a civil war. This is from a country that used to control them. Oh, so like why people of Afghanistan seek refuge from the Taliban, why not host them? Right, see, again, totally different. Ukraine is facing a human rights crisis. Oh, like the refugees from Myanmar, mm -hmm, in a way, but they're also fleeing from the potential political corruption. Like the refugees from Venezuela. These are white people that need help. <laughs> so, so you see, they joke about it. They joke about it because we're the only ones that don't seem to see it, brothers and sisters. But yet we've got our people crying for Ukrainians. I'm not putting Ukrainians down, but when are we going to start crying for ourselves? When, when are we going to start shedding those tears for ourselves and our children? Brothers and sisters, this is the Hidden Truth Show. And now we've got to that moment, brothers and sisters, whereby we are so gassed and excited to start Talking about education, our youth are now standing up. So you see our yeah! children are standing up and there's a big shift in education right now. And I'm so gassed, brothers and sisters, to introduce to the platform at long last, at long last, our queen, our empress, <laughs> our leader here in the UK, but coming from Jamaica or laying from, um, giving us the seeds from Jam Down. Brothers and sisters, Sister Rosemary Campbell Stevens, MBE. We thank you, Sister Rosemary. How are you doing, Queen? I'm doing very, very well. I'm doing very well, Andrew. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, Sister Martha. I've had to put in the earphones because the rains are, are coming down. It's really, really heavy. So I'm hoping that it won't um, affect us in terms of the link from here in Jamaica, but it is a real, 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 real pleasure, Andrew, to, to be here with you today. Real pleasure. And, and can I just explain to everyone on this platform, brothers and sisters, you see the works that I've been doing for how many years in schools all over the UK? I'm saying it publicly to you right now. It is Sister Rosemary Campbell Stevens right here on this platform that gave me my first major break. I was doing little things, but once this sister, took me under her wing. And this is true, sister, and you know I'm telling this true, yeah? If you remember, sister, we met at the airport. We met in America. When I was Philadelphia. Doing some, work, doing some work in America. Airport, yeah. You remember at the airport. What airport was it again, sister? I think we, we, we were in Philly. I think it was Philadelphia, Philadelphia airport. I was, I was out there as a part of another team. Sister there was a part of another team. And um, we was doing, I can't remember the conference in Philadelphia. On the way back, I met the sister at the airport. And one thing I've learned, brothers and sisters, I, the sister didn't know about me, but I knew everything about her. When I wrote my book, this was the sister I chose initially to do my forward, but she was so busy with so much work, she couldn't get around to it. And once I saw her at the airport, sister, I still remember it was like yesterday, sister, 
our planes were delayed. Am I lying, sister? You're, you're telling the absolute truth. And you know, you know what we've gone out uh, um, independently to speak about? Black schools Woo! and supplementary schools. Do you remember the radio programs that we did out there? Yes. We were joining friend. up with our comrades across the sea, talking about the importance of black schools and about us as black people uh, educating our own children. How many years ago was that sister? My God. Matt, I, I, it, it's, it has to be, uh, it has to be around about 18 years. 18 to 20 years ago. The, the, re met, the, re we yeah, the reason I know it yes. is that on, on, in the airport, you did the matrix breakdown How on your laptop. And Ankara was with me, Marva, on that trip. And I said to Ankara, um, this man has to be part of investing in diversity. And when we we're coming back on the plane, me and Ankara were thinking through the shape of investing in diversity and Andrew Mohammed was part, was part of it. So that's why I know because investing started in 2003. So it was before then. Look at that, nearly 20 plus years ago, sister. And, and what I wanna say to young people on the platform and to everyone, Get, was it take all opportunities available? I met the sister at the airport, the plane was delayed, and straight away my thinking is open that laptop, show the sister what I can do. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we've got to have that mentality. Take opportunity, it will come in a way that you don't even expect it. But by that one meeting at the airport, she changed my life forever. I went up and down the country with the sister and I personally saw the respect and the reverence. And this is no joke, sister. I was with you. We went up and down different, um, um, all over the country. And I saw when white, European, British head teachers, when you walked into their school, sister, they near enough bowed to you. Anything you said, it was gospel. They got all of their staff to come and listen, sit down at your feet and understand the purpose of education. And by you taking me under your wing, sister, you allowed me then to go and open doors to other people behind me because you opened the door behind you, sister. And that I wanna say publicly, we've got near, near enough 400 people on the platform now. I wanna say publicly, sister, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you. You changed my life for the better forever forever based on your work and sister please brothers and sisters please let's show some love to sister rosemary campbell drop some fives if you understand how powerful this sister is for brother andrew Mohammed. drop some fives on the platform drop down some lick shot pump babylon on the platform drop down some bun and cheese on the platform put down some chicken back foot on the platform you don't know every single time. <laughs> oh my God. Sister, before we go into your presentation, please, before yeah. we go there, sister, and Sister mm -hmm. Marva touched on it, but I want yeah. the two of you to under to really break down, because I don't think people understand, especially if they're not in education, mm -hmm. what investing in diversity done for education in the UK, especially mm -hmm. in London. Because many times we see these black, we don't understand that there was a process that took, it was the most successful program ever by the Institute of Education. I want everyone to listen to me. The most successful program was done by these sisters for the Institute of Education. Please sister, just show, let us know what, what was invested in diversity, please. Right, well, Andrew, um, Marva, will, Marva will come in because Marva, Rollins and Dawn Ferdinand, I, I tell you, they are beyond, beyond excellent. They ran the primary end of investing in diversity, but it links up to so many of the questions that people have already shared in your space today. So it's a good thing that you ask me this. And I'm having yes. to raise my voice because the rain is coming down. Really raise deep. your voice, man. Sure. <laughs> raise my voice. In 2003, 
um, there was a, a great deal of concern about London schools and about London itself. Yes, my queen. And so at government level, there was concern about the extent to which London schools were performing in a way that would ensure that students in London schools could actually compete on a global stage. Yes. And so um, 80 million pounds was invested by the government in the London challenge. So what? if anybody wants to look at 80 what? million pounds was invested in the London challenge, which was about improving schools in London. A small part of that was looking at leadership in London schools. Yes. And so I was invited by some people from London Challenge. And the reason that I got the invite, Marva, was that Femi Bowler Femi. put my name forward <laughs> All right, to somebody in London Challenge and said, well, this woman is up in Birmingham, but she's done a lot of work in um, London, bring her down. And we met at the Institute. And there were about 12 black school leaders. I was looking in the chat um, when Jarita was talking about her experiences with some of our people. And there were 12 black school leaders sitting around the table in University College London. And the question was put on the table, do we need a bespoke program for using their parlance BME leaders to get more BME educators leading London schools. And 10 out of the 12 black leaders said, no, mm. we oh. do not. Oh, no, no, no. We Stay do not. Again. No, no, rewind, rewind. rewind. I'm just, listen, because you know what rewind. people, Nothing, nothing that we're talking about today mm -hmm. is new. If we just connect with our elders and understand and understand how systems work, and as Ivy Scott put in the chat, how we have become dehumanized, decolonized in our thinking, then we will understand how we have to show up when we are conscious. Come on, sister. So Femi Bola said, yes, we have to have a bespoke program because MPQH does not deal with the systemic racism that our people are facing within the system. Come it's on. not a lack of um, our confidence. It's not a lack of competence. And remember, in 2003, I'd already been an educator for 23 years. Woo! So in 2003, when Marvel was talking about Lung Waltham Forest, I was an inspector in Waltham Forest. In 19, 1989, I moved down to London. Stop and it. I was an advisor for institutional review and development. Stop and 1993, it. When they first started Ofsted, I was trained up as an Ofsted inspector and I was working in, in London then, a London borough of Waltham Forest. And there were more blackhead teachers mm -mm. in Waltham Forest, in Hackney, in Haringey, than there were in 2003, mm -mm. 10 years later. 10 years later. So when I'm sitting at the table, when I'm sitting at the table at University College London, looking at my watch because I'm ready now to get my train back up from Houston and go back up to Birmingham. I said to them, yes, we need a bespoke program. Yes. And it's not going to be for no ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. It's going to be for the global majority. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And because I'm looking around at my fellow colleagues, some of them yes. are blackhead teachers that I knew. Yes. If you need somebody to develop that program, I'm the person to develop it. Woo! 
And me pick up my bag and me run to catch the last train from Houston. Yes. Back up to Birmingham, expecting not to hear a word from anybody. Yes. And the following week, I was invited back down to London by London Challenge. And the instigators in the background, by the way, Diane Abbott MP. Mm. A lot of people have a lot to say about Diane and a lot not to say about Diane in their disrespect. They yes. don't know what she causes to happen behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you. Right? Outside of the public gaze. Thank you. So I was called back down and the long and short of it was, by the time the meeting was finished, a commitment was made by Lord Andrew Adonis. Yes. That funding would be put aside for a program. We called it Investing in Diversity. It would be housed at University College London and I would be able to, uh, I would be developing the program and leading the program and being able to choose my own team, which was one of the things that I stipulated. There we go. That gentleman, I think is from cohort two. If I'm, if, 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 uh, listen, there we go. The long That's and short big. is that yes. 3.5 million was put into investing in diversity. Three, point five million was put into investing in diversity over an eight year period and 1000 teachers went through the program in London alone. It was bought by University College Toronto, uh, University of, 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 of Toronto in Canada in 2009. And it was called Leading for Equity Out There and um, a Jamaican woman as well, Avis, Dr. Avis Glaze, behind the scene. I had one meeting with Avis Glaze. She didn't know me from Adam and she put the money into the program in Toronto. What happened in England is that all the other leadership programs that focus on getting more black teachers into um, leadership positions came out in, of investing in diversity. Martha Listen. and Dawn wrote those programs, whether Listen. we're talking about equal access to promotion, whether we're talking about diverse leaders for tomorrow up in Yorks and Humber, whether we're talking about the Liverpool program or the Bristol program that Paulette Wisdom ran, yeah. whichever of those programs Listen. They all came out of investing in diversity, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. And there are head teachers now who are sitting in position in post. And the great schools like the Brampton Manors that are turning out the students who are getting their places at Oxbridge. Back in investing in diversity, I know for sure at least 10 people from Brampton Manor went through investing in diversity. I bear witness because I got I got bookings from Brampton Manor based on being in the um being reviewed and investing in diversity because their teachers asked me to come there and I would have known them if it wasn't for investing in diversity. There you go. There you go. So we look at Margaret Mann, bless her. <laughs> Look, we 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 oh, we did a thing with investing in diversity that changed not just the face but the heart of leadership in London and across the UK and as I said in Canada and so in part the reason that I've written the book is because we've been whitewashed out of that history. If you go and look at um, any kind of evaluations on the London Challenge, you won't see my name or Martha's name. You won't see investing in diversity, but written we out. know. Written we out, know. sister. Written out. So you know what? We have to write up things ourselves and um, put down our, lay down our own blueprint. And that is why I have written the book 
um, educational leadership and the global majority decolonizing narratives. The audience is us. I had to tell a few white people who were jumping into my space, trying to talk to me about certain things that I really wasn't talking to them. The audience is us. For this us to way. understand who we are and what this we need to be way. doing. No, man, I've gone clear, Andrew. You've gone clear, sister. I've gone proper clear. You understand what I'm saying? So... But, but sis, before you go there, because we want to talk about your book, we want yes. to talk about your event next week. Don't worry, we're going to yes. deal with all of that. We're going to deal with your presentation. But just two quick things, sister, before you go into your presentation. Yeah. So, I don't know if you know the effect that you've had right across the UK and I know into Canada because because of investing in diversity one of uh, one of the participants there uh, was a Canadian sister Asian sister from Can Canada and based on her being there and based on myself being on your part of your team in that investing in diversity sister I was able and that's I've got to thank you again sister that opened the door for me in Canada before I knew it, I was doing a tour in Canada throughout schools, throughout the whole of Canada. And again, sister, that was based on the work that you'd done, sister Marva done, sister Dawn done, sister Femi done. Again, there would not be no brother Andrew Mohammed if it wasn't for yourself, my queen. And I've got to say this publicly to everyone. Also on top of that, sister, not only that, but based on your investing in diversity, it was there that we met a sister who was a part of the course Lady my art Adele. Lady my art Adele, are you there, <laughs> sister? Lady my art Adele. This is where I met Lady my art Adele on your course over 20 years ago. Lady my art, I'm allowing you to come in now, my queen. Wow. I was, I was going to ask, our evening family, it's lovely to be back on again. Andrew, I haven't even been able to take the T-shirt off from the weekend just to let you know. I can't take it off yet. It's still on. Mom, Papa G. <laughs> So I was going to say, I was going to ask, start by saying, um, Sister Rosemary, do you even recognize who I am? Because I know you've got been through many young people and it's really wonderful for me to sit on the platform because in front of you and Sister Marva, I feel like the young one now. <laughs> because family, what happened? I, I was working in a secondary school back, must be in the early two, um, 200s. And a member of staff in my school said to me, when um, the discussion was, should, um, should I be, go into a senior leadership position? And I thought I was too afraid at that time to be the only black person on a senior leadership team. And a colleague said to me, Adele, just your presence in that room changes the nature of the conversation. You don't even have to speak, your color alone changes the nature of the conversation. And so I went in and I asked for the course, and I think I was the second or the third cohort and I did the investing in diversity. And from then, I, that built my confidence, actually, because you're always a, a loner. Even when you mm -hmm. do rise up, you're still a, min a, a minority um, within that group. And so I've risen up now. To, to, I'm an executive head today. Um, but a few years ago, when the organization said to me, Adele, you can have any mentor you like. Choose any mentor in the world that you like. And I said, right, I want Sister Marva to be my mentor. And I got all the way, and then they said, we're going to do away with mentors now. Don't worry <sighs> about the mentors. And I was devastated. And after COVID, they said, right, we're going to introduce the mentors now. Who would you like to be your mentor? I want Marvel Rollins to be my mentor. So from investing in diversity, Rosemary, where you led and got me to the position I am, I now have Marvel Rollins as my mentor. And so I feel so blessed to be able to even share this platform and with both of you today. So I want to say thank you because I'm where I am because of both of, of the work you're doing. And Marvel, you're keeping me in check because you know how difficult it is. It is, is there. So that, that is my story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, just to say before I say anything, sis, I've been, I don't know if anybody and Brother Andrew said, take every opportunity. Uh, Sister Rosemary, I've been looking at the, the books on your bookshelf there. Let me tell you what you've got there. You've got the bell curve. You've got the <laughs> Sankofa bird in the background. You've got the Jamaica Proverbs book. You've got the book Taking a Stand, the American Diaspora. And I think you've got the ISIS papers. Absolutely, Chris Wesleyan has to be there. So I know Sister Rosemary's bookshelf now. I need to know what I need to go and re-read. Uh, re so, so yeah, so that's just my um, 
my little story that I just wanted to, to say before we start. So thank you <laughs> to both. So what, 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 what I'm going to do at this point, Lady Mark, because I know that you're going to be having a conversation. I've got some questions. Yeah, we, some questions. we can't wait for this conversation between the three of you. Sister um, uh, Rosemary, if you would like to start your presentation and what we do, we do the discussion after you finished your presentation, because I think a lot of food will come out from your presentation. And then I'm going to leave it with yourself and Lady Ma Art. OK, Brother Andrew, now. How long have I got for the presentation, Brother Andrew? I'll try to be... 30 minutes, sister. Right, okay. Can you see my screen? Beautifully. Okay, so let me um, just go to slideshow. Let me play from start. Brothers and, and sisters, we've got the great legendary Rosemary Campbell. As you've seen, the effect that she's had all over the UK, and especially on Andrew Mohammed and Lady Ma'at. So please tune in now. Get your pens and papers ready, because this is going to be a night of learning. Go ahead, my sister. Okay, so the title of my book is Educational Leadership and the Global Majority Decolonizing Narratives. And if we are going to be up to date and use pronouns, my pronouns are we, us. There's no me without we. And that's a space that I operate in. And when I think about how I was socialized, that picture of me in my baby dress was when I was five months old. And my mother said to me, that I was sitting up and that I was sitting up unaided. And she said to me that I came into the world knowing. That's me at five. And I think you can see how intentional I am, as well as the fact that I love my pretty dress with my pleats. And I'd made a decision that day because I had, I had one choice that I could make about what I could wear in my hair. And uh, the reason I'm saying that is that in my home, I was seen, and I was heard, it, I, it, I it was intended that I would have opinions. It was intended that I would be, uh, you know, have things to say. In 1969, one of the many books at the top of the, of, of the bookshelf are the books that I received at school for verse speaking and for making up stories. That The Water Babies was presented to me in 1969. There it is, Rosemary Campbell. I would have been eight years old. I have been socialized to be black, to be beautiful, to be bright, and to be present and situated and opinionated. So there's no surprise that when I left my beautiful primary school, 98% black in Hansworth in Birmingham, and went to the grammar school where it was the other way around and we were the minority, that I, under, I was already grounded in my culture and who I was and proud of being black. So that whatever undoing was gonna be happening at King Edwards, I was able to actually outgrow that. So I began at King Edwards Grammar School, not to see myself as exceptional, but to see these white spaces, revered white spaces of education as being very limited, very limited. And so 1976, I was a student, I was a, a, a teenager, and I was sitting and watching a documentary on television, and I think it was this week, and it was covering the Soweto riots in 1976 when African students were took to the streets to protest about two things, a third rate Bantu education, and being taught in Afrikaans instead of Swahili. And as a 15 year old, I sat there listening and watching to that documentary. As a 15 year old, I was kind of pretty serious. I was watching documentaries. And I listened to those students, not much older than me, stating the importance of education to them. And I decided then that I would be a teacher. Why? Because I needed to be a teacher who could stand alongside, not in front of, I stand alongside students like this. The young man there that we see bloodied and carrying and being carried is Hector Peterson. I, don't, I didn't know at the time who the, who the girl was running next to him. I found that out when I visited South Africa many, many years later. But that picture was an iconic picture 
in my Saturday school. We talk about what we should be doing, running our own damn schools. In our hey. Saturday school, in hey. our Saturday school, that hey. was an iconic poster every time we went in, every Saturday. The school that I was running, that I started to run, Saturday school that I was running, and some of those students who are now lawyers and teachers will be at the book launch next week to talk about how Saturday school saved them hey. and, how they, and how they turned out, hey. right? The last register that I remember taking at Saturday school, we had 200 kids turning up every Saturday in Handsworth, coming to one of the many Saturday schools. Roots was the other thing, was another um, social awakening for me. And I always wonder, what is, our, what is this generation's equivalent of roots? That's when I actually located myself as being an African and connected to being uh, black, to black Africans. And those of us who are of a certain age remember the characters, um, Kinta Kunte, Chicken George, some of you will remember that. And that was an awakening for us as students. So my socialization, my politicization began in Birmingham through my schooling, through the education that I put myself through. So yes, I did my, my training at Birmingham University, but my real training took place at places like the International Third World Book Fair. The International Third World Book Fair was something that ran from mid eighties right through down into the nineties. That was where we bought most of those books that you see on the shelves behind us. That was where we sat down with the CLR James, with the Francis Cres Wesleys, those and, and the Naim Akbars. That's where we met those people. We bought their books and we had those conversations. And in a minute, I'm gonna drop a tune because there used to be a backing track, yeah? We used to be going to all of these places and we'd be going to clubs, going to the Africa Center down in London, going to a clubs in, the, in, in, in Birmingham and with blues and part of the music was part of the way that we socialized, internalized as black and African people. And I started at the African Self-Help Organization for those who know Birmingham 104, Eatfield Road. These people were running supplementary schools, by the way, from 1964, 1964. And the first school that they, uh, they ran in Birmingham that used to be up on Dudley Road, for those people who know Birmingham, was shut down by the Home Office. There is nothing new under the sun. Know your history, know what you need to do. This is a page from one of my supplementary school um, kids' books. I have six of those books, they're falling apart. You can see the date, 1983. What were we doing in Saturday school? Black history, Marcus Garvey, Steve Biko, Malcolm X, Shaka Zulu, Harriet yeah. Tubman, Kwame yeah. Nkrumah. How yeah. did I know, how yeah. did I know that yeah. nearly 20 years later, I would be sharing a platform with Steve Biko's son in Corsonati Biko in South Africa, talking about African-centered leadership. So for me as a teacher in mainstream school, yes, I did my BA, yes, I worked in mainstream school and I went right through the ranks. I became a head teacher, I became an Ofsted inspector, but trust me, even as I was doing those things, I had one foot in community, just like Marva Rollins. One foot always in community, doing what needed to be done. And in community, we see curriculum and pedagogy as autobiography. Teachers, curriculum and pedagogy as autobiography will begin to decolonize our students' minds. And the student and teacher will be liberated by that, whether we do it in our own schools or within the system. Let me bring you up to date right now. Another page in another exercise book. You see my telephone number, 5237219. Yes, my, students, my students needed to have my number. Notice they're not calling me Miss Campbell, they're calling me Rosemary. Why did they need to have my number? Because of the stop and search laws and because of the way that the police was operating in schools in 1983. Your revolution, right? In 1983. So our kids knew that when they got 
picked up and took to Stone Hill Road Police Station and they got one phone call, call them teacher. Who am I gonna call? Obviously their parents to let them know what the situation is and the black lawyers that we were working with to ensure that we could get our kids out and that we could get our kids out safe. 1983. So Just when people me. when people Just talk to me about you, you, you know, you're you're radicalized. Yes, me radicalized from time. Come in, brother Andrew. What are you saying? Mr. Rosemary, I just want to say I've fallen in love with you all over again. Brothers and sisters, are you listening to this queen? Now you can see the she's what opened the door for Brother Andrew. And the way she's talking today, she talks at this regardless of the um the audience. Sister, we love you all over again. You're bringing back memories. I'm just pumped up tonight. Come on, sister. <laughs> And, and Andrew, the reason that I can open doors is because I recognize contribution made, those that have gone before, those shoulders on whom I stand. So just as I am honored, Andrew, for what you have said about me and what you've said about Marva, I have to honor these two brethren right about here. And trust me, next week, there will be on my panel, Professor Goss John, Professor Goss. Elaine Foster Allen. They will be on my panel next week because they've been part of that 40 year journey. And what we must recognize and what the young people must recognize, and I am gonna preach, recognize contribution made. Elaine Foster Allen was one of the first black HMI in the UK. She is out here now in Jamaica and she has served three different ministries, including the, 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 um, the, the office of prime minister as, as permanent secretary. These are heavyweights. Dr. Professor, uh, Professor Gus John, I, 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 I have no words. That picture was taken in around 1992 by a sister, Mbeke Wasame, who will also be at um, the, the, the launch next week. She's a fa fabulous educator, worked all over the world, largely worked in, in Africa. She was the photographer who was documenting them. I was a newly uh, appointed advisor in Waltham Forest and I called on these elders thinking, who am I to be calling on them to come support me? Look at them, look at them holding me up. So you see, when we're moving forward, we need to understand our history. Investing in diversity, this is one of the papers that I wrote um, in 2009. And as I said to them, it's not, it's not about getting more just black melanated people sitting in the seats in this systemically racist system and, and contributing to the annihilation of our race. We actually need people who change, not just change, we're not changing the face, we have to change the heart of educational leadership. And as, as, as Andrew says, I don't care where I am. This presentation is not changing. I have, I have not changed it. You know, that's why I accepted the MBE because I wanted people to know that people like me get MBE. And you know what the, I accepted the MBE for? I accepted the MBE for being a radical, for being a disruptor, for being something who's been challenging this system from, from, uh, from, from, from the beginning. And if they want to give me an MBE for burning down Babylon, so be it. Leading for equity, that's what we called the, the, the program in, um, in, in uh, um, Canada. All right, I'm moving on. We haven't got time for this. But please I'm go onto my YouTube. This. I'm loving this. Go onto my YouTube channel and, and listen to the global majority. Listen to the global majority, and you will find out what that is about. That young woman that what I made, because the book, the little book that I've written is just over a hundred pages. It's called a pivot. People were telling me, people haven't got the, the extension span to read a, a, a book that's just over a hundred pages. So we created a little video that is a hundred seconds. And it tells you what the global majority is. Go on to Rosemary Campbell Stevens YouTube channel, watch that video, subscribe and like. Andrea Howden, who produced that video, 
will also be at the book launch next week. Global majority mindset is, uh, and, and framework is about a paradigm shift. It's not about fitting into something that's existing. It's about shifting the paradigm completely. And we have to ask ourselves from whose perspective, in whose interest, who benefits and who does not, for what purpose is education and to what end? I am running fast because I want to get through. One of the, you know why the bell curve is on my bookshelf? That the sister, you know, sister is good, you know, on the most look power people bookshelf. The bell curve is on my bookshelf because when I became an Ofsted inspector, I wanted to look at the systems that we were using for assessing learning and the roots of those systems, where them come from. And when you read the bell curve, you understand it's eugenicist thinking. Eugenicist thinking is really clear. It's not complicated. There is a hierarchy of races and we are at the bottom. So any assessment system, any curriculum, any teacher training that come out of that eugenicist thinking is gonna have that thinking baked in. And it doesn't matter how much program we are gonna run till we pick me there. As long as we are in a system that continues to assess them using their standardized assessment tests. And then when you bring that together with teacher messed up thinking about our children, we are always going to be coming out using their measures at the bottom of the pile. So as an Ofsted inspector, one little black woman Ofsted inspector, because then the day there, there wasn't very much of us going in, me I walk with my bell curve. Me I walk with my bell curve and me I ask question of the Ofsted inspector about the extent to which what we are doing in terms of assessment has racist, colonialist, Teach. imperialist thinking Teach. embedded in our measurements. So I'm not gonna be catching at nobody's table. Don't bother include me, don't bother diversify me in our space. Sifi me table, yeah? Una all welcome. Blackness is centered right in the middle. Oh, well and we, we as black African people are the center of the global majority. Rosemary. There's no global majority without we. Come on. Africa is the youngest and most dynamic con uh, con continent on the globe. Yes, there's more people in, in China, but the age demographic is against them. Yes, there's more people in India, all part of the global majority, but the age demographic is against them. In Africa, we are the youngest demographic. And so what does that mean? Resist the narratives, the Bill Gates narratives of we're overpopulated. There's not enough to go around. We have to be depopulate. Resist those narratives. There's a reason for that because them all know who the global majority is. And on top of that, we're melanated to rock stone and we need the melanation. And them know so them need the melanation to take them through. So read some Francis Quest Wesley. She went there, she went there. Um, and that's why the mainstream would never accept what she had to say about what the white race's real problem with us is. So the diversity and inclusion agenda, I'm not knocking none of our brethren when I have to eat and then I have to do what I need to do. But all I'm saying is, if I bring the diversity, the difference, who's the norm? So I'm not gonna be jumping into this, white people are the world norm. White people are 15% are of planet earth. We, with the other global majority, make up 85%. If anybody gonna be including anybody, it's me to include or no. You understand what I say? Okay. All right. So the book. Rose me. You're killing me tonight. It's You're six, killing me tonight. Six chapters, man. Six chapters. Just making it clear for people who the global majority is. 
and taking it deep in terms of investing in diversity and why the program was the way it was and how we challenge one another as black people on that program. Marvel will remember, we used to stand up at University College London when people register for the program, some people would be drawing them dead cell because somebody sent, said them to come. And me and Femi would be looking at them and saying, you know what, you don't actually need to be here. If you need to go and read a couple of books to find out who you are, and when you come and you just see black people running this thing, and you don't feel like you want to be a part of it, it's okay, go and fix up. And when enough fix up, enough can come back because there's a long waiting list of people coming. So global majority is about us understanding who we are on planet earth so that we can be vibrating, not surviving in some racist cesspit, but vibrating at the level of humanity that we need to vibrate. But in order for us to do that, in order for us to do that, we have to understand the racialization process. So listen, man, I went back into history and it took me to some dark places. Chapter two, I still haven't recovered from writing chapter two, two the racialization process. Me go way back beyond, beyond the little slavery time. Me go to Aksumite Empire. Me go to Benin Empire. Two African empire me are talk about in this yes. global majority. So global majority can understand where them did go to, to learn. Yes. Then we go to chapter three, disrupting narratives and language and the power of language and decolonization. And somebody put in the chat earlier on, they referenced an academic, um, Mwegi Wathongo. He is reading my chapter three right now. And I'm hoping that he will come and bring his, his knowledge because what he says is, if we continue only to operate in the oppressor's language, there is no liberation there. I'm not saying don't use English. I am saying that we must be able to communicate and conceptualize and think of ourselves in other languages. He is a, 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 um, a Kenyan activist and, 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 and writer, and he will be commenting on that. The Seven Sisters, Seven Steps is a real story. Going back to what Marva said about the black school, right? that was in, in London and you're right, and people in the chat, it was the Seventh-day Adventist school. It was John Loughborough, John Loughborough school in Haringey. And we were unable to save it. We were called in, we were called in and we were called in too late. We were called in in December and by the March, they closed it down. It was too late. But you know what the seven women, seven steps one is? That was the junior school, the, the Birmingham school that me and six other sisters saved. Saved because we had a little more time. We had a little more time, right? And that is the Harper Bell School in Birmingham. So that's where we lay out how you work within the system to do what we need to do. We need to be culturally competent leaders and we need to be able to look back, like the Sankofa bird, go back and find what we lost, remember who we are and bring that into the future in order for us to move forward. I'm not ramping, I'm coming down. When they remove your language, they remove your culture and they destroy you and they destroy your memory. They erase your memory and they erase your ways of knowing and being so that you end up like a shadow walking on this planet. And you see me, our house right here is built on plantation land. Right next door in my sister's garden, there is a gravestone with the plantation owner, for the plantation owner and his daughter, right? Who would have owned my descendants on this land right here on the, in the land of Jamaica, land of wood and water. So Come that's on. when we go gone clear because Come we on. have to deal with reality Come rather on. than some theory sitting in a land and a chat some foolishness. Come on. Seven women, seven steps, vibrating to consciousness. Talk you through that. Why? We have to disrupt. We have to restore memory. We have to situate ourselves in the middle of the conversation unapologetically. And when people are broken up with conversation, we need to make them know so we now talk to them. We have to find a space to heal. 
because that's why so many of us are fighting with one another. That's why we have the crab in the barrel mentality. That's why we hate ourselves. That's why we can't turn up with a natural hair upon with head. Rosemary, stop it. Shut the that's front why, door. That's why, that's why when the them door. disrespect our picnic, strip shut search her while she menstruating in school, we have to shut them out. Yeah? Because we're not healed. And then we will inspire something different. Come and on. Me them chapter there, when we start right down the global majority um, framework, knowing, remembering, decolonizing, being, conceptualizing, awakening will be six of the seven pillars. All right. There is precedence for us. Let me step out for a minute as African people and talk about us joining with the rest of the global majority. It's not about us being subsumed by the global majority. I am clear in my book that the global majority came out of us as African people. But when we are in our rightful place, we will understand that there is precedence for us as African and Asian people, Asian including Chinese, had to correct somebody on LinkedIn the other day. Oh, you're talking about Indian, what about the Chinese? Global majority, what? global majority, there is precedence. I'm gonna read, read about this. Bandung Conference, 1955. African nations, African, black African African uh, um, activists from this, um, America, Asian nations sitting together without whiteness, talking about what we can intelligently cooperate over. And this is no naivety. There's no love loss. I'm not going into no kumbaya land and know what's happening with the Chinese in our, in our, in our community and know what's, ha what's happening with our, our Asian brothers and sisters. Sometimes we can't stand alongside, but sometimes we can. And we need to find those points of intelligent collaboration and there is precedence for it. The next Bandung conference is due in three years time and I am wrangling an invitation because what I think that we can do collectively is to decolonize our education systems across the global South. So what do we need to do closing now? Meanwhile, meanwhile, Every city in the UK that has majority, global majority students will need to develop our underground to Canada system for those that Marva rightly says, the majority of our kids are going to be in that system. So we got two parallel system going. Reimagine our supplementary and community schools support those of our, in our community who are homeschooling. And those who are going to the state schools, the killing fields, in each city, like Harriet Tubman had the underground to Canada, we should have Fui Map, which say, them only go to that nursery school. Them only go to that nursery school over there, run by Liz Pemberton. Them only go to that primary school that Dawn Ferdinand is running down in London, or that such and such Sonia Thompson is running up in Birmingham. They only go to that secondary school. We have enough conscious people to find a way through, man. And once they leave that secondary school, they go to that college where we also have conscious black people. And then when they go to university now, where we have less control, the coaching and the mentoring from the community and the community elders ensure that we have a caliber of young people coming through. So identify the destination, don't be giving up. We we'll just need to fix up and focus and stop being distracted by foolishness. Identify the destination, know the system, just like on the North in London, know the tube map, Anticipate where the blockage is gonna be. The one and two black people who frighten now are you? The one and two black people who more learn less frightened than themselves. Listen, when the sewage report came out, I remember the conversation that I had with Mr. Sewell. 
Me and him used to end up on platforms together. And one day at one of um, Diane Ansys, uh, um Abbott's conferences, I said to Tony, Tony, um, I, 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 I would really love to have a conversation with you. I'd just have to love to have a conversation with you because we've never really spoken about our real positions on these things. You know, we say things on a platform. We try to give the man the benefit of the doubt. We went and sat down and broke bread together. I didn't get past the starter. Because hey. Tony said to me, Tony oh. said to me, Tony looked in my face and said to me, Rosemary, the reason why I do the things that I do is because you can't be telling white people about no systemic racism. It doesn't sell. Oh my God. I, don't, I don't know if any of you ever watched The Godfather, the first one, The Godfather, part one. <laughs> and um, when my man goes to meet the corrupt um, police officer in a restaurant and they've already put the gun, a gun in the um, toilet, and, yes. he, uh, yeah, and, and, and his decision was, if yes. the conversation didn't go a certain way, he would go and get the gun and have to assassinate yes. him. And I don't know if you, I don't know. Yes. Okay, there yes. was no gun in the toilet <laughs> at the restaurant where me and Mr. Sewell did sit down and eat. And I don't care. I'm saying it out because Tony Say. made it clear. Say. Right? So what happened was we just ended our meal and parted ways. Avoid the distractions. Conserve your energy. Train your crew. Recalibrate when necessary. Find your tribe, man. For every one black person who mixed up and, and, you know, messed up, there's 25 that you can meet at any airport, at any shop, in any marketplace, in any school. You will find them. Find your tribe. It's easy. And once you're vibrating, the universe will bring them just like Andrew bro was brought to me and Marva and Dawn was brought to me out of nowhere. We never know them and, pe and people bring them to me recalibrate when necessary and create safe passage through. That is the end. That's the Woo! end of my presentation. Brothers and sisters, did I not tell you? This was the Jurita, Samira, Lady Adele. This was the, I call her my mother, not based on age, but she's the mother. I was not be doing what I mean. I'm just blowing up today. Oh, wow. Sisters, how are we going to duplicate you? And I'm going to say this very quickly, sisters, because Lady Adele's coming in right now. Sister, one of my proudest moments ever in speaking was when Tony Sewage shared a platform with me and told me publicly he doesn't like me. That was the proudest moment mm -hmm. in my public life. He said, I don't like that man there. And I said, thank you, God. I'm doing what's meant to be done. Sister Rosemary, I love you. I don't care, I'm saying it publicly. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, sister. I'm gonna shut the front door. Brothers and sisters, if you're feeling my queen, drop some rock stones. Drop some rock stones today. Lady Adele, I'm moving straight to you, sister. Straight to you. Wow, that's incredible. It's so good to see, still see and hear that we have people within the community who's still willing to speak that kind of language without worrying about interpretation, without worrying about people's sensibilities, care. without worrying about the politics and agendas and propaganda. It's so refreshing. And one of the things I do know, and Investing in Diversity has done this, not just to me, but to others, is to be in that forum and have tears in your eyes because you know that what you think feel within yourself as a, a black educator that you're so fearful to say and do that there are uh, brothers and sisters out there like Rosemary, like Marva, who's willing to say the voice and have our back in a way really. So if the, if the weakest thing we can do is to quote you and say, Sister Rosemary said about the institutional racism, because I'm too afraid to say it, at least I've been able to see it. So that alone empowers us, those of us in education until we have the strength and courage, maybe an experience to say it for ourselves. So thank you very much, um, Rosemary. And I know Marvel's knows the difference. Marvel was telling me alone that she was saying to a man the other day, you pay me the same as, you, as a white middle-class man. I don't come less than that. And I thought, 
Ooh, okay. And then <laughs> she didn't blink an eyelid or, or sweat a brown. I thought that's, that's the kind of leaders and the parents we want in education. So I've got six questions and I'm going to speak fast because Andrew, brother Andrew has this terrible thing of doing all of a sudden say you got five minutes. You don't go with 10 minutes and then five minutes and then three minutes you just come tell you you got five minutes left and there's a lot i want to do and i've got my notebook because i'm taking um so, so, um some notes here but before i ask a question i just want to wanted to say as i was listening today that um through investing in diversity with yourself rosemary and, and marva you you help to get a lot of um um, educators into leadership positions right up to headship positions and beyond and we're now in that place but I've noticed what the shift has been because now we've become answerable to CEOs of businesses now mm -hmm. CEOs of of trust so all of a sudden we've got to climb another rung on the ladder because we have this oppressive force coming down so it's almost like we didn't move so really as as, as um you're talking and answering today I'll be thinking in the, in the minds of how can I encourage other young leaders that Yes, you may be ahead now, but it doesn't stop there. And we've got another glass ceiling um, to break. So my first question, and you mentioned, and, and this is both um, Marva and you, Rosemary, whoever wishes to answer. Um, you mentioned the global majority. And I know you, you are, you, you are um, quite, you're the one who created that phrase, really, Rosemary. Um, but where do we really sit in the reality of the minority? Because we're the global majority. Um, so where do we really sit in the reality of the minority and what does that kind of look like? You were talking about this parallel um, universe of education and black education that we need, but we mm -hmm. still remain under the influence of the mi 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 minority. So my question is, I get that, but I still feel my voice is not going to be heard. I hear you. I hear you. Um, there's, there's two things. There's, there's a few things to say about this. In Birmingham and in London, the student demographic for global majority, Black, Asian, and so on, is 73% in London. And 60, something like 69% in Birmingham. They've now started to collect the data in different ways so that we're not even aware of it. So part of our thinking is actually truly understanding that we are the numerical majority. That's the first thing. The second thing is that what we bring to the system can actually change the system for the better for the majority, including the white working class that Martha is talking about. Both the schools where I were leaders, was a leader, was majority white in secondary schools. Both of them. And I was often the only black person in the school apart from the cleaner, right? And in both of those places, I turned up black because I'd been looking at the biased assessment systems I'd be looking at a curriculum that wasn't fit for purpose. You don't have to be looking, obviously I'm looking at it from a black perspective, but when you turn up black and operate black, then you actually bring something to the system that is beneficial for everybody else. So really, we don't have to be shouting about the global majority thing too tough. We just need to turn up knowing that we are. And we need to be connected worldwide with other global, with other, you know, there's a whole set of black educators in the States who are in exactly the same position as in the UK. There's, 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 there's uh, black people in Africa. I'm working with, with, with people now in Nigeria, now going to be working with people in South Africa who are also looking at their colonized education system same kind of biased assessment, same kind of crap curriculum. So instead of this minority majority binary conversation, what I'm saying is turn up like the majority, do the work, do the reading and find out how what you bring when you turn up black, obviously we're gonna be focusing on our people, but wherever we are, I was talking to people in Northumberland this morning, ain't no black people up there except a few confused one who get lost. 
right? So basically we have to look, well, and we're talking about what do we bring to humanize their systems? Sometimes you have to pick some, you know, less triggering words, but actually what we bring can actually create a better space for everybody by just asking those questions and being ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I've been so often the black, only black person in the room, but I've never been the only black person in the room. That's I'm always right. sitting there with my own tribe. Marva? Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I think for me, just knowing who I am, because being part of a global majority is not just a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing, it's my heart, it's my soul. So Adele, you know, we do a lot more. We do quite a bit together at the moment. And I walk into those spaces that you say with those middle-class white people and I'm so at ease with who I am. So I can speak my truth. I don't have to be woolly. I don't have to apologize. I don't have to say, I'm sorry, but I'm going to say this. I say yeah. what I need to say. And I think I don't, I'm just adding on to what Rosemary said. And that's a real safe place to be. And as Rosemary said, I'm never in that room. I have my mum in that room. I have my dad in that room. I have my great grandmother in that room. I have my grandparents in that room. I'm never there alone. And I have a message to give. And the message is, we are not doing right by our black children. You are not. And I need to see the change. And it, I know, like I said earlier, some, some of us don't go into that, Rosemary, but I feel, you know, that's me, isn't it? I'm going to yes. sit there and I'm going to talk to you because you have to change. You have to change what you're doing. And I talk to the young people in the schools as well. So Absolutely. being it's a way of being. Yes. But you do need, Adele, as you know, that support system around you. You do need the mentors. You do need the coaches. You just need an ear. Yeah, so that when you're wobbling, you come for support and then you go out again. Absolutely. And yeah, and it's not so much that I don't know if it's a good idea to have black schools. I've just been in this, not a battle, I've been in this arena for so long. So I saw Brother Mbendaka recently, Rosemary, at an event um, last week at the, at the, I forgot the name of the place, one of the museums in London. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he was saying the same thing to me, but he's been, he was said that 30 years ago to me about yeah. having to have a black school or have yeah. black schools because yeah. we really Absolutely. more than one. So we take our hearts and our souls into those meetings on damage because Absolutely. we have been and done the work for ourselves. So and that that to me that that helps me a lot. And then you know of course I'm old as well so no one's gonna get to me anyway. Um but it's a journey. Yeah. So Thank you. It so is, my next question, because um, as I was uh, thinking about uh, today, um, um, Bernard Coward's um, paper came back to me. Um, yes. How the West Indian child was uh, it, it was um, is made educationally subnormal, and I was yes. thinking about we always say when we meet together as educationists, the global majority, that nothing's changed. It used to be in thirty years. Nothing's changed yes. in forty years. Nothing's yes. changed in fifty years. The conversation is exactly the same. So what needs to be the focus going forward for us as an African people um, mm -hmm. to make a change in this current Western sort of dominating system so that we're not saying the conversation is the same 60 years, it's 60 years from now, or will it be that we'll always be saying that conversation? I want to know how we can break that cycle and make that piece of work almost redundant in a way. Okay, all right. So it isn't the same. I think we're always going to be talking about inequity because we live in an unbalanced, inequitable world. So we're always going to be talking about inequity. But if we look, you know what needs to change? We need to change our narratives. Mm -hmm. We need to share the success stories. Yes. We need to share the blueprints. We need to share the things that we have done that has enabled us to prevent it being worse than it is. We have moved on and there has been progress. There are many, many more students who've gone on to do fantastic things. There are many black head teachers who we don't know their stories because they haven't been collected and we haven't shared them. And what we need to do is to share that strategy. You started with Bernard Coward. That book, that pamphlet 
was written for us mm -hmm. in University College London, by the way. But it was printed, you know, the black bookshops then got together and raised the money to print the book. That was a conversation to us about we, what we need to do about us. And so for, for me, there is always going to be, as long as imperfect man inhabits earth, there is always going to be a conversation about inequity. Mm -hmm. There's always gonna be that conversation. But what we need to counterbalance it is, is with our narratives of triumph. Our narratives of triumph. When I come to the UK uh, in May to talk about my book, I'll be doing a lecture at the Bartlett School of Architecture. Nobody will know that unless I actually tell them. They invited me because they said, we need to know about global majority in the Bartlett School of Architecture. One of the Tuesday mornings, I'm gonna be talking to the top 10 HSBC executives in Birmingham because they've invited me to talk about the fact that their global approach to finance and the way that they look at black people and how we manage money. Do you know that they see partner as, as, um, as, as, as us, um, um, what, what you call it, laundering money, partner? No. You understand what I'm say? Do you know that they're not, they're not aware that actually Jamaica earns more from remittances than it does from tourism? I'm just giving you two examples. Mm. We don't share our success stories. We yeah. don't share our ways of conceptualizing. People don't know the success that we've had, the difference that we've made. And so we, that's what needs to change, Lady Adele. We do need you to- mean, sorry, sorry, Do you mean the sharing between us as a people or the sharing to the minority yeah. as well as the majority? I, I, I'm saying both. I'm focusing 85% of my time is with my people because mm -hmm. I got less time ahead of me than I got be behind me. I'm looking forward to ancestorhood, yeah? Mm -hmm. So 85% of my time is with my people and doing what we need to do because that's where my... But if I, if I can talk to HSBC Bank and them can do something in the banking world about the debanking that's going up across Africa and the Caribbean, yeah? So that we can utilize our money and stay paying down on debt, yes? Come getting back our own money from the colonizers that them give us in debt. Then I'm gonna be having those conversations too. And I would do it 85%, 15% Adele. Let's do the work that we need to do amongst yeah. ourselves. Let's gather those stories, mix with the academic, get the black academics, Paul Miller, et cetera, et cetera, to be gathering the stories of success of black head teachers, not black head teachers struggling, Look at the success stories, write them up, share them, share how they have managed to navigate the space and what they've done in the 20 years and happily gone home to retirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to share our own stories and develop our own strategies. And it's the developing the strategies that the others are gonna be busting down our doors for because they've run out of ideas and we've got them. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to add to what we said. I made two. Sorry, Adele. I'm just let me add on to you, Marva. I was just going to ask when, when Rosemary, you said develop strategies, do you mean strategies for sharing or strategies for something else? No, strategies for us to uh, actually sub not survive, thrive within this system. Mm -hmm. For my strategy, rethink supplementary schools, develop homeschooling. Mm -hmm and talk to our colleagues in the state who are doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. Develop our own resources, get our black bookshops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do the kind of work that Andrew is doing in schools with us. And those of us who are working in the system, develop like I did that map, yes? That takes us through, what, are, what can we do in terms of the curriculum? to make it less of a killing field. What can we do in terms of assessment? We still have to use SATs. You know what the people that are in the States are the, the, the National um, Black Network are doing in, 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 they're developing their own assessment 
that goes along standardized mm -hmm. tests. Yeah. So they get their teachers bright enough and, 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 and creative enough to get their kids through the system so they still take those exams. But we as black educators, we want to develop character. We want to develop racial affinity. We want to develop racial pride. We want to develop our, our young people contributing back to our system. So yes, we can set up our own banks. Yes, we got our own agricultural system, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the network in terms of the black educators that I'm looking at, they got their own assessment system for their kids. It might not happen in school, but it's that whole thing about developing us as character. That's what, we, that's what I mean by strategy. That's what I mean by strategy. I'm, I'm, just yeah. gonna, I'm just gonna come in at that point because I'm loving this. I'm loving this. I see the platform is loving this. But Adele, before you go on to your next point, very quickly, and it, got, it ties in what Sister Rosemary has just been stating, um, the fantastic news I've got for all of you, brothers and sisters, next week's show, as Rosemary was just mentioned about connecting with America and learning from the States, Next week's show, brothers, is you, you're going to love me for this. I'm a bad man. I'm a bad man. We have got Professor Kabar from New York next week. He is world internationally known. Professor Kabar, he's going to be at the, um, the, the Houston Detroit conference. And guess what his subject matter is going to be? African education versus the school system. Woo! I'm going to say that one more time. Shut the front door. Africa, African education. True, what is education versus what is the school system? And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, Rosemary Campbell has destroyed the platform tonight. He's coming back here now to try and fix it back up again, okay? African education versus the school system. Can you imagine one week having Rosemary, then the following week having my father, Professor Kabar, mommy and daddy coming together. So next week's show, Professor Kabar, you cannot miss that. Lady Adele, back to you. So thank you, Brother Andrew. So um, Sister Marva, did you want to contribute to that? You were going to say something. Before just I move a on little to bit, just a little bit, because Rosemary, um, we're always on the same wavelength. To say that nothing has changed is negates the work of the West Side um, Young Leaders Academies and all the other Young Leaders Academies where our Black men have worked so hard to hold our young youngsters together and to give them a vision and a hope. And it also negates in the work like, like the Rich Society I mentioned earlier, when every year Black professionals, the surgeons, the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, they come together and this year, I think probably about 800 young people before the lockdown, we had 1700 came to the event in Russell Square to talk to these, well, not elders, some are elders, but some are quite young um, entrepreneurs as well, to talk to them so that they can make connections with, if I do math in school, this is the sort of career I can have. And these men who have walked the walk, they give up their time freely, not just that once a year, but throughout the year to support our young people. So there are lots of things. What we probably haven't done is knitted them together to make one garment, yeah? But there are lots of things, and I say lots of things make one big thing. So we just have to know that in our community, we have some extremely dynamic people who are holding our young people together. Some are slipping through the nets, it's true. Yes. But, um, and, and, but yeah, it's so many, I mean, I know lots of great things are happening and we're moving on, but it's the pace I think is what we're talking about when we think nothing has changed. But if we keep telling ourselves nothing has changed, then it's gonna feel as if nothing has changed. Thank okay. you. So I'm just going to go um, going to go to an Ofsted kind of related question. There's a new buzzword now in Ofsted, and the new buzzword is um, cultural capital. That mm -hmm. we've got to put our children in a position. That's all children, so they have cultural capital. Now, if we look back to the original definition of that terminology, cultural capital, it's a very imperialistic, mm -hmm. colonialistic mm -hmm. phrase that mm -hmm. often um, it, that you get into the private independent schools. And cultural capital is all about how you use people and systems and processes around you to ensure you remain on top and defeat anybody who, who is considered less than you. But we're now using that term um, 
I think quite inappropriately for everybody on cultural capital. So what I'd really like to know is how should we be defining that term cultural capital when we think about our young black people, not in terms of Ofsted's um, definition of it, because that's already what it is, but how should, when we're thinking about using that term with our parents and our pupils, what are we saying cultural capital really means? Absolutely. Well, the first thing is that we do exactly what you said. Yeah. You know, we understand that the English language is extraordinarily limited in terms of its capacity to convey meaning. Mm -hmm. And so we say how we use in cultural capital. Yes. I say to uh, when people say, oh, we haven't we're not passing down genera generational wealth. I say, well, how do you me measure generational wealth? You know, we have a wealth of knowledge. A wealth of knowledge. And that is where my cultural capital lies. Mm -hmm. I know that when I turn up in any space, the wealth that I bring, the cultural capital that I bring, not only that, I'm actually vibrating as a human being. There's a lot of people that we're mixing with or a lot of beings that we're mixing with that haven't evolved to that level of humanity yet because their cultural capital depends on them dehumanizing us. So I've got to a space where I don't need to dehumanize anybody to understand what my cultural capital is. And that in order for me to look at the solutions that we need, whether it's climate change, living with long-term COVID, finance, overpopulation, whatever, when I bring my cultural capital, my global majority lens to that knowledge, then that's the richness. That's the richness that these people are seeking from me and from us. So Adele, it's about us understanding the limitations of the, the English language. It's extraordinarily limited. And I know for those of us who, you know, I speak well in inverted commas, I was a teacher of English. So I have a love-hate relationship with this language, mm -hmm. but I understand the limitations of it because it's based in eugenics. Do you know that the guys that put together the Collins and Webster dictionary, they argued about which words would go in and if they didn't like the word, it didn't go in. Mm -hmm. yeah? So actually we need some broader language. We need a wider lens. And so what I tend to do is to say, this is the way that I am defining cultural capital. We were the first people on the planet. We were the birthplace of civilization. Mm -hmm. Everybody else on the planet came to learn from us. Everybody else that you all look up to, the Greeks, the Jews, the Indians, the Chinese, and they've recorded it. They came to Africa to learn from us. That is my cultural wealth and the cultural capital that I bring. So if you want me to bring some knowledge to the table, it's likely to be melanated Woo! Africanized, Woo! indigenized Woo! for centuries. Come on! That's my definition of cultural Come on. capital and adapt me I work with. Lovely. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, uh, Marva, do you want to add to that? Or because I know you're you're kind of close to the offstead uh, agenda at the moment, because I know that you kind of uh, some of the work you're doing. So that's what yeah. that's how we're looking at defining cultural capital for us as a as a black people. Yeah, right. I really so try hard not to use, one. yeah, I try so hard not to use the term because immediately what springs into my head is the expectations that we will take our children on a coach or on a train and take them into a museum in London and they're going to find out more of what that's what cultural capital is, yeah? So I struggle with that terminology. So Rosemary, thank you. I'm going to go into school next week. We're going to tell them what you said it is. Um, but yeah, so I, I generally don't use the term, but I know Ofsted looks for it, but I'm still not sure what Ofsted looks for when they're looking for cultural capital because they don't define it either. And it really does feel as if the more my children know about the, the, the white artists and the white right people, the better they will be. They'll be better able to do the SATS papers because they'll have a better understanding of English culture. So I don't, I, I avoid it where possible. Marva, yeah. I would just say, Adela, no, we're running out of time. Take them to the museum, as we do. Yeah. And get the kids to read white man, Dan Hicks book, 
the brutish museums. Okay, right. Right? To show them what them teeth from our, you, you, we, we wanna deal with British culture? Go read Dan Hicks, the British museums, and take them to the British museums. There'll be a few empty plinths though, because they've had to return some of the Benin bronzes. Those what them not sell on the open market. Yeah. So yes, go show them about culture and go show them about British culture and what British culture did, because British culture is showing it in those museums. It's just that it's who's taking the children. That's the issue. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying, you know, when people used to, sit, when with the same white people used to sit down with me and, you know, have argument and they're saying, oh, you know, you're trying to um, change British history. Um, you know, I said, I don't care whether you teach about Mary Seacole, you know, too tough. Mm -hmm. I ain't too bothered. All I need you to do is teach about the Industrial Revolution. Well, not to change the curriculum, teach about the industrial revolution and tell the students where the funding came from for their great industrial revolution. Tell the truth. Sometimes we feel we have to go find something different. Just tell the truth for them now tell. Take them to the museum and show them. Damn, damn. Damn! My backside, right? Woo! Rock star tonight, Rosemary. Woo! So I've got another right. question, um, um, and it's linked to Neely Fuller's and the um, that big piece of work he he does and the nine areas of humanity that talk about education, health, economics, all of those nine particular areas. So we we still recognise that we there's a lot that we have to address in that, and there's still some ongoing challenges. How do we really um, deal with that on an educational level and start to make the differences in those nine areas, if not all of it, in which ones of it, um, so that we can start making that shift? I'm not familiar with the nine areas, so Marva will have to I'm help me sure. out here. I'm not, I'm not sure. familiar with the nine areas, but let me tell you something. Anything that we're doing in education now that isn't about healing, forget it. Mm -hmm. Forget it. The education, the schooling process is a traumatizing process for yeah. black and white students yeah. alike. And so I am hoping that in those nine areas, somewhere there is something about healing and curriculum as autobiography. If we moved to curriculum as autobiography, Define that, please, Miss uh, Rosemary, so that we're clear, us educators uh, are clear what you're asking. All right, about. okay. My, my, my position is, if I were to come back again or even get an, an, another opportunity, right? One of the reasons that I think our curriculum is so um, um, destructive is that our students do not see themselves reflected in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And no child on planet Earth anywhere should leave an education system without knowledge of self, who they are, why they're here, what their potential is. So when you look at the damage that the curriculum does to us and to others that it others, it is about them not having a curriculum that in which a, a curriculum of autobiography, you can't have it in every single lesson, but in every subject area you can. In every subject area, somebody should turn up and say, I see myself, and just in I hear myself, and I just, can be myself. And just in support of that, Rosemary, when I work with teachers, I often say, I always give this task is, look at your own subject area yeah. and just list for me the top 10 people and it's quite incredible that, that many of us as black educators can't name no. 10 black people from our area. So I teach maths yes. um, and I can't, I can't name, or I, then I couldn't name you 10 leading people. So even if the curriculum is the curriculum that I have to follow, I can, I can indisperse it with what I know from the 10 leading people. So I'm saying to teachers, if, if in your subject area, you can't list and know about and talk about and share the great works of at least 10 black people across history within your subject and their contribution, um, 
then you don't know your subject and you don't know yourself. So Absolutely. that for me is an air, that's a simple way of doing it while yes. still being in the system. So I like like that definition, the curriculum as autobiography. Absolutely. And if it's not people that you're mentioning, it's ways of seeing and ways of doing things. Yeah. There are ways of doing things that have nothing to do with white people and, and, and you know, the 85% of planet Earth has different ways of, of doing all sorts of things. So when we're looking at um, Africanizing, globalizing the curriculum, it is about knowing about people, but it's also no knowing about concepts, ways of seeing, ways of being, ways of doing, whether it's cooking, whether it's dancing, whether it's creating. When I went to, 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 to Kemet in, 19, in, in, in the 1990s and went to Cairo Museum, I thought I was gonna just spend three days in Cairo buying perfume and, 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 and some nice handbag and shoes. Then Cairo Museum captured me. Three days, I just kept going back. There's nothing now that we're dealing with in 2022 that you can't go back to Cairo Museum and see that our ancients were dealing with, including flying blooming planes. Mm. Mm. We like, don't understand what we don't know. Yeah. Like you say, we don't know what we don't know. So we, we need to get up and, and, and Curriculum know. as autobiography. Mm -hmm. Work in progress. Mm. Lovely, thank you. And I've got, I've got what, one, I've got another question here really to support the leaders. There's many leaders now, and that's black leaders and probably white leaders as well. But as for us as, as, as a black body of people, there are many leaders who are feeling trapped now in a system that has really become a business. Education is, is a business now. Money's involved, whether you work for the government, it's a government state school or a private school, um, money rules everything. What advice would you give to leaders who are now trapped in a system that has shifted from education and the child and onto money being the center of, of, of focus. How do we harmonize? How do we harmonize that? Because some of us have to stay in the system because some Absolutely. of us have to explode it from the inside out while others are throwing a bomb from the outside in. Absolutely. Um, Marva, I don't know what, whether you okay, want to go, on, go just, first, but I've got, um, okay, I've got some ideas. Go. Education, no, as a leader, mm. education for us, it's always been about, budget has always been at the forefront of a lot of what we do. Mm. We just had to be conscious leaders to make sure that our children were at the forefront. But for years now, we have had to manage very complex budgets. In the old days, the local authority managed the budget, they gave the school leaders a curriculum budget, and we could, although that didn't happen very well, focus on curriculum and teaching and learning. Mm. But we've been asked to save money to cut, make staff redundant. So that's the teachers may not see it, but that's what the leaders have been faced with for a long time. So we have to find a way of keeping the children at the very heart of what we do. And we have to keep that pressure away from our colleagues. And so that's what I think um, leaders need to do. Well, we can't hide away from the fact. I don't think since 1994, when we had local uh, LMS started, when school budgets were given over to the schools, that head teachers have had a time when they haven't had to worry about finances. Yeah, it's just that we don't sit in the south room and talk about it. We sit with the it's school business we manager. That, the feeling under great pressure yeah. um, to deliver. For, for, for young people um, in a system now that doesn't that is run by people who don't think about young people, that their agenda is, is else, elsewhere. We're talking about the, the, some of the academies, yeah? Their agenda yeah. is elsewhere. But that was the government did the that, ladies, didn't they? They created this, um, this, this process. Two Sorry. minutes left, two minutes left. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be real. And then really we and I will carry on that next week when we meet. Yeah, we meet absolutely. Next, we meet on Thursday, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's been ever thus, Adele. This is the thing. I know this isn't a great solace. It's been ever thus. Mm -hmm. Education is part of a capitalist system. Mm -hmm. The only reason you have an education system in the UK is to maintain the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So once you understand that, then there are different ways of navigating. We haven't got time, but I will just say to you, um, 
Brother Andrew, you're going to have to invite me back. I'll tell you how a group of no, white, no, no, 39 white head Woo! teachers did this in Darlington in terms of the academization process, how they got together and did something completely different in clear sight. Have oh, we got to wait for part two? Yes. Brothers and sisters. You can't keep us educations and <laughs> as parents waiting too long for part two because it's a big, Whoa, we're big gonna get that area that is taking leaders out of education for this very thing because their heart is for the young people. They can't push back anymore and they, and they just leave. And then you get young entrepreneurs in who, who are falling into this money system and they're not picking okay. up the skills of the elderly mm -hmm. and the wise to mm -hmm. keep the children at the heart. And our black, our black children, they'll always be the ones at the bottom of all of this. So Miss Rava, Miss Rosemary, I need the answer yesterday. All right. As soon as Andrew can ad arrange it, man. Andrew, I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in UK in May. Let's find a way. Brothers and sisters, you heard it from the Queen. She took the words. I was about to say, Rosemary, I want to put you on live public air. Can you promise to come back? And she didn't even want me to say it. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you. I really don't know about you. If you want Rosemary Campbell Stevens MBE, got the MBE as an activist, please show it. Don't, don't tell me. Put it on the chat room. Do you want to see this sister come back quick for a part two? Because Andrew, can I just ask a question? Sister yes. Rosemary, does MBE mean mighty black educator? Is that what that Woo! means? From now on, Adele. From now on, girl. <laughs> can I just say Thank you, oh, Queen? Me. Oh, Thank you, Queen. Yeah. And oh, Miss Marva, you're going to be the outstanding of, no, black no, educator. No, order of, black, order of Black Excellence is what order I mean. Order of Black Excellence. Right, the old I've been calling that from the beginning because I, I contacted Andrew when I was first I'm um, approached and I said, oh, Andrew, I don't think I can tell anyone I'm doing this. And he said, of course you can, Marva, of course yes. you can. Yes. So that's how I rationalise it in my head. Yes. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you've heard from my OBE and an MBE tonight. And you see, they are more grassroots than ever. It shows it can be done. They didn't select none of their principles. They picked up their, they picked up their sword, brothers and sisters. And I'm telling you, I can testify these two speak like this, not because it's a black platform tonight. They speak like this because it's their heart, it's their soul, it's their mission. I'm gonna be very honest with you. Tonight has been blown out of proportion for me. It has been, I knew tonight was going to be fire, but tonight has been phenomenally tenfold to what I even I expected, because wow, wow, what a night. Brothers and sisters, you've seen the best. You've seen the best. You've heard the best. And, um, you know, brothers and sisters, Samira, are you there, my queen? Are you there, sis? Please, what, what did you I think? Am, I am, oh, I am. I've, I've been looking at the chat and I've been, I was making so many notes. Lady Adele knows what I'm like with my note taking. My hand almost dropped off. Um, Queen Marva, Queen Rosemary, it's been an absolute honor. And honor. I say that with no hesitation in my voice. An absolute honor hearing from you and not just hearing from you, but feeling your heart and knowing that irrespective of the struggle, and let's make no mistake, you mm -hmm. have had to go through some struggles, yeah. you're still in the trenches, you're not resting on your laurels. And I think that's the key for everyone to understand is that what these queens have been able to achieve, they in theory could actually just sit back and say, do you know what, I've had a great- Yeah, I've done my bit. I've, I've done, done my bit. bit. <laughs> yeah. But instead they're actually realizing that more we more. need them. We need each other, actually. Mm. And so, you know, Dorita, as a VP, as a vice president, she has something to offer. But a lot of the times people will assume that 13 or 14 years in education is too little. But what I love is that these sisters have recognized we need each other, not only recognize, they're teaching us how we can actually benefit from each other positively rather than what a lot of other cultures have done, which is actually to pit people against each other and strip them of their dignity, mm -hmm. strip them of their intelligence and rob them of their ideas and 
at their spirit, quite frankly, as human beings. Tonight has been absolutely, absolutely. magnificent, ladies. Are, 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 there any, are there any comments you wanted to read out, sister? Was it was any that, that hit you? Because I, I can see people are still putting comments down. I know once it said the best so far, the best yeah. so far on so armies. Um, sister, was it who's this? Cleve, is it Cleve, right? Thank you, Queens. Fantastic and powerful and unapologetic talking. I mean, it's just been non-stop. It, the it has been non and I've been I've been writing my notes to be honest. <laughs> but um, we do have well, Sister Sharon Sims Thompson wanted to know, brother Andrew, where have you been hiding, Rosemary? <laughs> that was one of the one of the comments that made me chuckle. But I mean, the thing is, is that Sister Heather Simpson has said my daughter's school play last month dealt with industrial revolution at one point all of the kids called out that the money came from slavery and where the cotton came from and that was something that sister mm -hmm. rosemary um had actually uh shared with us um i don't know who nh is um but nh has said you're not easy miss campbell's <laughs> <laughs> no fire so, <laughs> um and then we I mean, there's so many, so, so many. many comments that came through. Um, everyone is loving your elegance and poise, uh, Sister Martha. Um, we've got Sister Queen Martha, thank you for your continued commitment and presence with prayer hands, prayer hands uh, emoji. It's just been pure, it's pure been, fire. It's just been, I mean, I, I, Sister Samir, I ain't got no words. I've got no words for tonight. It's just been so amazing we've still got over 400 people still on the platform with laptops yeah. i can't imagine how many people if we include those who are on their um ipads and phones wow. maybe can, i'm sure we've got over seven eight hundred people still on the platform tonight from Power. all over the world but i'm saying to you brothers and sisters samira has been putting the link down sister rosemary's launch mm -hmm. and event when is give us the date again sister yeah it's the it's the 28th of april so it's <laughs> um Next Thursday. Next, next Thursday. Th next Thursday. Um, it's an event bright. I haven't even put the link oh, in the chat. It's 7.30 p.m. <laughs> that, <laughs> you can see I've been looking. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's, the link's been put down several times. Don't worry about the link, sisters. Yeah. Already, and I, I, know, I know a lot of people have been having problems, apparently, um, um, signing up. Uh, they've been told to wait or whatever. So... We've been, just been increasing the numbers and increasing the numbers. So we've gone up to a thousand now. Wow. This, yeah, because people people have said, I can't get on because there's all this such and such. And we, we've sort of done it at, at 500 thinking, yo, we'll get. But now we've had to push up to a thousand. And to, um, Tim Campbell's going to be hosting. Woo! Um, yes, brother Tim is going to be hosting. Um, and then we, we'll be hearing from Professor Goss. We'll be hearing from um, Elaine Foster Allen, um, Dr. April Warren Grice from the States, who I do a lot of work with, um, John Milmore from South Africa, um, a white man who's adopting now the global majority and have to pull down some of the stuff that he, so he's coming on to say what he has to do to yeah. fix up. Give um, and what they uh, give credit Absolutely. exactly, Absolutely. you know. Um, and then there'll be people like um, Sir Hilary Beckles from Vice Chancellor uh, University of the West Indies. He won't be able to be there, but what he has said he, is that he will um, um, be sending his endorsement. So there'll be a video because what we want to do is link the global majority, um, obviously, framework to what should be happening in terms of reparations and what we're, we're doing out here. And if it wasn't for um, elections in Barbados, um, we would have been having the prime minister of Barbados talking about how we're go to, going to be looking at now that Barbados has, has moved um, to um, be, be, yeah, absolutely, that's it, a republic what that means in terms of us as African people decolonizing education system because the current education system now go work. Now go work. <laughs> brothers, and sisters, you know? brothers and sisters, not only do we need to sign up for next week's event with um, 
our queen, Sister Rosemary Campbell Stevens, MBE. Please make sure you get her book. Let's support each other. It ain't about just sitting there and say, yeah, I'll support you, I'll sign up. Let's see if we support this sister financially, as well as with our, 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 our minds and our hearts, it allows her to increase her work and increase the output that she can deliver to our people. So brothers and sisters, there is a duty on all of us. Mm -hmm. I know probably Lady Adele's probably just already signed up for a book already. I bought it, Miss Rosemary. I'm going to bring it. If I can make it next Thursday, I'm going to bring it. I need that signature, a message from you in that book. So Absolutely. Brothers, brothers and that's, sorry, sorry, that's why that's why I'm doing the tour for um, from May 2nd through to June 12th. Um, yes. Most of it will be in the UK so that people who bought the book can come to um, some of the events um, and I will be, I'll definitely be doing book signing and so on. Birmingham University, by the way, have put it on their required reading list for anybody doing anything on educational leadership. When you read on the back, Colin Diamond, white man just went clear, gone, gone off his head in terms of the review that he's written. And he said, no, we have to decolonize this backside. And so he has made sure as um, professor of head of school of education, that it will be required reading for anybody doing educational leadership, talking to Leeds Beckett and also talking to University College London, they need to own it. I just um, bought it too. Well, I have to, I have to. it will be part of my thesis for sure. Please, please, Jurita. For Brothers sure. and sisters, we have to duplicate all over the UK millions, if not hundreds of thousands of Sister Rosemary Campbell Stevens and Sister Marva Rollins. We need to do, because we can't allow them to go with this library of information and it's not been duplicated um, along our line. So Sister Jurita, you know you've been an activist, you've been a revolutionary. We need you to keep under the wings of um, Rosemary Campbell and Sister uh, Marva because they're the people that will nurture you through the hard times that you're going through, Sister and they will maintain your strength and your integrity. Before we, um, before we close out, Sister Samara, you've got a quick announcement regarding something that's taking place tomorrow. I do. So for, and thank you very much, Brother Andrew. For anyone who um, sees social media as a scary entity, fear not, okay? Fear not, uh, tomorrow, 8 p.m. till 9 p.m. UK time, which is 3 p.m. till 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'll be hosting a free webinar uh, for anyone across the globe. It's via Zoom to tune into. It's an important part of how we can connect and communicate with each other. Community is communication plus unity. And social media is free. And by the way, if you use WhatsApp, you use social media. So what I want to do is to make sure that we break down or break away any kinds of stress and fear and use it to our advantage. So I will pop the link in the chat. It's completely free. Um, children can attend as well, because especially where we need to be looking at entrepreneurship uh, for our young people. Um, definitely, it's a, it's a 101 class, so it's a basic class. But anyone who's an entrepreneur, a non-for-profit leader, um, and anyone who personally just wants to understand more about the power of social media and digital marketing for your organization, profit or non-for-profit, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, 8 p.m. till 9 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. till 4 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. till 1 p.m. Pacific. There we go. <laughs> brothers and sisters, you've done that so elegantly. So as we now go into the ending, brothers and sisters, thank you. My name is Brother Andrew Mohammed, the investigator, Lick Shop Pump Babylon, Guan Papaji, and the Little Barlet Boy. Wherever you want to call me, <laughs> we are there. Brothers and sisters, don't forget the honorable Marcus, the honorable, uh, most honorable Marcus Garvey said, a people with no knowledge of their history or their roots or their origin or their culture is like a tree without no roots. They both die. And that's why today education was of the paramount today. Brothers and sisters, make some noise in the chat room for our queen today, keynote speaker, Rosemary Campbell Stevens, MBE. It was just phenomenal. It took us down a 
the what we call the yellow brick road all throughout our history. Make some noise for our sister Marva Rollins, director of director of the Marvin um, of the Rollins Education Institute, OBE Queen. Make some noise. You saw two radical sisters, beloved. Two radical sisters, never to be, never being afraid of who they are. Brothers and sisters, make some noise for Lady My Art, one of the children that came through investing in diversity. And in many ways, I'll say this humbly, if it wasn't for investing in diversity and the work of Marva Rollins and, and the work of Dawn Ferdinand and the work of um, our queen, Rosemary Campbell Stevens, there wouldn't be a hidden truth platform because I'm, no, I'm keeping it real. It was all connected. I met Lady Adele from investing in diversity. I got into schools by investing in diversity and so on and so on. It was, you know, we are the children of this revolution that took place 20 years ago, brothers and sisters. So it's now affecting the whole world. Mm. It's affecting the whole world. As I said, next week, brothers mm. and sisters, daddy's on the platform. Professor Kabar from New York City. Professor Kabar Kamenei world-renowned historian, 